Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today I have Matt Tucker of Koan coming to us from Palo Alto. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm envious. I'm up in Corte Madera in the cold fog. He's down in Palo Alto where it's sunny and crisp. Um, how long have you been out in Palo Alto? Since 2010. I've moved here from Portland, Oregon uh, to open office for Jive Software uh, here in Palo Alto. Oh, sure. Jive. Yeah. They, they either went public or were acquired. What was the outcome of Jive? We, we went public. So I co-founded Jive way back in 2001. Uh, and then we IPO'd in 2011. And then I finally left Jive in uh, 2016 in order to start Koan. And then company sold to private equity in 2017. Okay. Private equity. Gotcha. I could have a whole podcast interview about that because I think that would be interesting. But um, uh, let's talk about Koan for a little bit. What, is, what does Koan even mean? That's an unusual name. Yeah, um, I'll start with what we do, and that helps explain what it means, too. Yeah. Um, so we're essentially leadership software, uh, so we help companies and teams with their strategic cadence. Uh, so things like goal setting, um, uh, OKRs uh, in particular. Uh, and the idea is basically take all the positive behaviors that great leaders and great teams know how to do and that often live in spreadsheets and very manual behaviors and build software around it to try to make those great disciplines and behaviors easy for every team. And uh, so koan, uh, the name, uh, koan is a real word. It's a Zen Buddhist practice. It's where a Zen master poses a question or a riddle to the Zen student. Uh, what is the sound of one hand clapping is uh, one of the more well-known koans. And very loosely, we like that as an analogy for great leadership. Uh, basically, the idea of passing on enlightenment through questions and then the process of reflection leading to continual improvement and ultimately finding, finding good answers. Are you a Buddhist practitioner or are you just a kind of sync sync I'm not. Think of what you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> no, it does it does resonate. Um, no, and I, I'm definitely not a, a co-on expert either. Yeah, it's cool though. It's always fun when companies have a little backstory to the name. So give some examples or use cases and, and maybe if there's a startup use case that might be interesting, you know, when does a startup need co-on and what would be a typical like installation and kind of use case? Totally. So I am definitely a believer in in startups, even at the very early stage, getting some of these fundamentals uh, right very early on. And fundamentals to me mean things like we actually write down our mission statement, which is deceptively hard. Uh, We are thoughtful and write down our vision and our strategy. Uh, And even at the early stage, um, we write down our goals or OKRs. By the way, apologies in advance. You're probably going to hear my one-year-old screaming in the background uh, briefly during this podcast. (laughs) It's the reality from working at, at home today. Um, the you know, at goals in particular, or OKRs, um, you know, that can be a little bit more challenging in startup phase because things do change so rapidly. Uh, and so setting goals and measuring progress against them. Uh, if you're, especially in the very early stages of startup before product market fit, then key is just, all right, uh, be agile about it. Don't take it too seriously. Um, you know, things are going to change a lot. So maybe don't try to set quarterly OKRs maybe try setting monthly targets. And if things change, then that's okay. Uh, In general, the reason that companies bring us in and our target customer, we do work with uh, a lot of startups, but usually, you know, once you get to 50 or more people, and especially as you start to scale to multiple hundreds of people, the challenges of alignment and clarity around uh, the strategy and having transparency around metrics, those start to be really big, hard problems and trying to solve them through spreadsheets and all hands meetings. Um, it, it just doesn't cut it anymore. And so that's really when uh, folks come to Koan. Um, I remember back to the, the Jive days, for example, and we did what a lot of executive teams uh, do most quarters, which was get together. Uh, we'd argue a, a little bit during our, um, uh, you know, our quarterly offsite. We'd finally agree on the goals. We'd write them down in a PowerPoint. We'd show that PowerPoint deck to uh, the entire company. And then nobody would ever really talk about the goals again until next quarter. Mm-hmm. And Koan is meant to uh, help teams and companies solve that to stay really engaged with 
what those critical strategic priorities are. That's interesting. And so let's unpack it a little bit more. Like if you're setting, I like that mission and you set a goal and then you break that goal down into target numbers or metrics and then can the managers and employees sort of see, is it, I'm almost envisioning like a meter bar or progress bar towards those goals or how's it kind of like, you know, look and feel? Yeah, totally. So the, the sort of dashboard where uh, there's clarity around the metrics and everybody can see the progress, that's definitely super important. A uh, big part of what we try to facilitate in Koan is uh, collecting the qualitative insights from everyone. And so we do that through a really simple business process we call a reflection. Usually uh, people are doing reflections weekly and it essentially looks like answering a few questions. You get a Slack alert um, it says, hey, it's time to update your team about uh, the progress over the mm -hmm. last week. And out of the box, we combine questions that essentially covered a lightweight way of doing a weekly update or uh, the dreaded, dreaded status report mm -hmm. uh, combined with a way of checking in on your goals. And it turns out that if you pair the quantitative data, like how we're tracking to the metrics with the qualitative insights that everybody has stuck in their head, like, oh, well, why did this metric change this week? Why are we a little bit behind on this goal? Are we actually on track to hit it? Uh, if you combine that data, and especially at scale, uh, you start to have breakthrough conversations about um, how to stretch further as a team than you thought was possible. Interesting. What, you can pass on this question if there's not a real answer, but like as your startup is going from, you know, a couple guys and gals to a small team to something that's starting to scale, maybe it's after raising that, first round, you know, what are some of the like first goals and metrics that you see startups typically starting to layer on? Like, you know what I mean? Like I, it's almost a mystery to me what the, those first metrics should be if there is any commonality. Yeah. It can be hard to measure things before you've shipped a product, for example, and before, all right, how many active users do we have? Zero. And um, you know, what's our revenue? Zero. Yeah. Um, so there, there are some challenges in those really early stages and, I think you know, a lot of what's important at that stage is just for everyone on the team to be really clear, like, here's what we're trying to do next and why. Um, you know, it can be, here's the experiment we're, we're trying to get in front of beta users, and here's the, the paper prototype. And it doesn't necessarily need to be written down you know, super formally as you know, a set of metrics uh, and measurable goals in um, you know, the objective and key result format. But at every stage, no matter how small or how large you are, actually you know, writing down, here's what's important to us and here's what success would look like. Turns out that that is always challenging and always valuable. Uh, and yeah, even if it's before you can track some of the traditional SaaS metrics, mm -hmm. um, like monthly active users and um, monthly revenue, you can still write down what's most important and your theory about how you're going to start getting to the next milestone of success. Yeah. And do you think when those first, that makes total sense. And then do you think the first couple of metrics are things like monthly active users, revenue, probably churn or um, NPS. I mean, is that part of something you're tracking or like, you know, what are those first? Certainly. Couple? Yeah. At, certainly at, at our stage we're we've done two seed rounds. Uh, we have uh, a, about 180 paying customers um, and quite a number of them now at quite large scale. Um, so things like NPS and revenue and, active users and all the product metrics are are super important and uh, we're a couple of years into having shipping product you know on the earlier end um you know maybe there there is a danger of trying to um, track yourself against metrics way before you actually do have product market fit and um, so it might be worth you know the debate where are we really at uh, what does it really look like to um you know have tremendous success um and then I always like the exercise of thinking out, you know, a year from now, all right, what would, what would be amazing if we could get here? And we're, we haven't shipped a product, we have no revenue, but what would it look like to have 10 referenceable customers? And then walking back uh, a little bit, all right, well, what would we, what would we need to do six months um, from now? What would we need to do this month? What do we do this week? Um, those types of conversations are clarifying in, in terms of setting your priorities. And, you know, it's always true uh, at large companies. It's even more true at small companies. Uh, there's always way too many things to do. There's always way too many options. And so figuring out that smallest number of most important things to work on and really put your energy behind, that's critical. Yeah, good. 
Very interesting. Cool. So let's talk about fundraising. Um, how much have you guys raised? And you mentioned two seed rounds. Yeah, we raised a total of $5 million. We did a first seed round uh, for a total of $2 million, and back in 2016 and then uh, announced in October a $3 million second seed round. Interesting. And um, these are both venture, venture led or was the seed round uh, angels or, or both? Uh, some angels in both, but uh, definitely venture backed. Um, so we were lucky enough to um, essentially be founders and residents with uh, Maynard Webb and team, uh, who I consider a mentor for the company. And they're an amazing uh, investment team and win. Uh, and then we had some other great investors join that first uh, seed round. Uh, SV Angel, uh, a small firm called Spider Capital, which is awesome, uh, and Crosslink, which is a larger firm. And then Uncork uh, led our second seed round along with our other uh, seed investors participating. Yeah, interesting. Jumping around a little bit, but is, is Ron Conway still doing SV Angel or is it his son now? Or who's, in, who's SV Angel? I, I think it's um, both of them, uh, but I, I believe it is Topher that is um, doing most of the, the daily. Uh, I'm not intimately uh, familiar, but I think that is the case. Yeah, just curious. I, um... I remember I used to hear so much about SV Angel and I feel like it, it's a little less amplified, but it's still a very reputable firm. Um, interesting. So talk about putting these together, maybe just go chronologically. What was, you know, what was, how'd you kind of put these rounds together? I'm sure it helped that you had the jive, <laughs> the jive exit in your, in your uh, background, but you know, it certainly was, helps. Um, yeah. yeah. To raise money, just go first, have an IPO. Um, and then, right. That's a uh, <laughs> simple that's equation. Fun. That's all. Uh, no, I think one one thing worth noting, and it uh, has been a really interesting, actually, uh, interestingly challenging process about seed fundraising, is that despite all the years of, of Jive experience, I actually had no experience around what it would look like to do uh, seed funding at uh, this stage. Uh, so we bootstrapped Jive for uh, almost seven years, and okay. we were an incredibly scrappy uh, startup in those early days. Um, went after an interesting use case and um, were lucky enough to get some amazing uh, early customers. And so we were able to scale revenue and be very profitable in those early days. But uh, I think we were at least a 10 or $15 million business before we did our, our first Series A back in 2007. Mm. And you know, certainly helped that you know, Facebook was out there and MySpace and, and you know, consumer social had blown up. And so the thesis for Jive was, um, let's take all the momentum that we built and uh, the product leadership that we had, but lean into these bigger consumer social trends and go tackle that for some interesting business use cases. Um, so my experience was you just uh, you know, sweat it out, bootstrapping for year after year after year, build a business. Um, and then you know, when it's beyond clear that it's time to scale it fast, uh, then, you, then you do your, your venture founding, uh, your venture round. Um, so this time around, it was, excited about an idea, had a very vague um, concept of the product we were going to build. I uh, did some research and ideation and then went out and uh, tried to uh, raise the seed round. Uh, I think the challenge for me was, all right, um, I'm a little bit uh, you know, more, hey, I'd like to see real evidence. There's no evidence. We haven't even built a product yet. Um, so having that uh, sort of chest thumping confidence, but in a you know, legitimate a valid way. Um, that, that was a hard, hard uh, mindset, mindset shift to get into. Yeah. And, and just for anyone that's not familiar, Jive was, it was kind of like a, a business focused social network. Is that even a close to accurate description or totally, totally reasonable short version. Uh, so collaboration vendor, um, and there was two major use cases. Uh, we powered a lot of the uh, large online public communities, um, white label in fact. So Almost everyone has been on a Jive community somewhere on the internet, uh, probably without realizing it. And then the other use case was uh, as a better uh, large scale collaboration tool internally. Um, so typically we would sell to very large companies around the world. Something you mentioned is pretty interesting. Like Jive was bootstrapped for seven years, which is amazing. Like, did you think about just taking that same approach or you were um, too impatient to do something like that with Corner? You know, why not bootstrap it again if you've successfully done that in the past? Yeah, it, it's a, a good question. I don't know that I have uh, the right answer, a definitive answer, um, but I think it was um, saw the opportunity to do it faster. Um, and you know, if you 
you feel like you've built pattern recognition, whether that pattern recognition is true or not, uh, is always an interesting question to ask yourself. Um, but saw the opportunity to, to do it faster, had conviction that what um, the, the problem that we were chasing and part of what got me excited about it was it felt uh, a little bit like some of those early signals from the Jive days uh, in terms of uh, you know, these conversations around future of work, the number of companies kind of generally in the space. And so I think I, uh, we convinced ourselves that this was going to be an opportunity where you know, bootstrapping probably wouldn't work, that we needed to go reasonably fast. Um, and that the best way to do that was through venture capital. Yeah. It makes sense. Is it a competitive space you're in? I, I feel like I have seen others. I, we might have even had one on the show. I'm kind of uh, foggy headed right now, but uh, is that part yeah. of it too? Back back in 2016, um, I, I would say it was vaguely competitive. There were definitely folks out there. And uh, at this moment in time, uh, it feels like there are 8 million software startups chasing the same thing, <laughs> which is usually a good sign, um, but uh, a challenging one. And in particular, um, you know, OKRs, uh, partially out of John Doerr publishing Measure What Matters, uh, and the success story of um, that particular goal framework um, in Silicon Valley, and uh, actually a lot of, uh, around Europe as well. Um, that has fueled a lot of um, startup activity and market momentum in particular. Uh, we're thinking about the problem a, a little bit more broadly than just OKRs and goals. We think that is one pillar in you know, what it means to have a, a great uh, leadership and strategic cadence at companies. Um, but that's definitely the market beachhead for us. Sure. Makes sense. Um, and then, so how did you actually put together this list of investors? Are they just folks you knew from Jive days or did you, you know, do run a formal process, build a target list, all that jazz? Yeah. And I mean, I didn't really know seed stage investors, um, you know, our investors uh, at Jive, which uh, were fantastic. Uh, it was Sequoia uh, for a series A and B. And then uh, Kleiner Perkins came in uh, to participate in our series C. Um, so that was about the totality of the investor world, uh, as I knew it, uh, generally speaking. Um, and so, you know, I think the that the really uh, serendipitous and um, introduction was uh, a friend, mutual friend, meeting up with Maynard and team, um, you know, talking about ideas that they were excited about. And um, Maynard shared, you know, among his list of uh, software ideas that he was really excited about was uh, software eats bad management, mm. uh, kind of riffing on the, the Mark Andreessen quote. Sure. Uh, and mutual friend was like, oh my gosh, uh, you have to meet, um, my good friends, the, the founders of Koan, um, this is kind of exactly the problem that they're working on. Uh, and so uh, that became um, a mentoring relationship and uh, first, uh, first check relationship. Um, and then you know, tapping into that network um, was a great way of getting introductions to other investors and really strategizing out what is a, a great initial seed round look like and what should the early stages of, of Koan look like. Um, so anyone that's lucky enough to build a you know, initial um, great investor relationship, uh, that, that can be a fantastic way of then building some momentum in the round, figuring out the strategy for raising the rest of it, um, thinking through things like valuation, um, you know, all those early challenging questions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This does seem to be kind of a, com a, a recurring theme on this show of people by luck or circumstance stumbled into an investor who was working on a thesis, like you're saying, you know, software eats bad management. And then it's kind of, uh, you find an investor who's looking for a deal like yours. Like that's part of this whole process, which means you got to put yourself out there. Um, had you kind of like shopped, not shopped, but shopped around a little bit uh, before you stumbled into this relationship with Maynard or was this just kind of, <laughs> you know? That was a, a fortuitous and, and I, I mean, it was probably within the first uh, week of starting to more formally work on Koan as a company before Koan had a name, uh, in fact. Um, you know, and I, I think you're, you're, you're generally right. Um, and one of the uh, definite themes uh, we've had many, many investor meetings that did not go very well. Um, I, I think a lot um, you know, on me in terms of you know, not doing a very good job of uh, pitching the story or what we're about or the opportunity. 
Um, but really there is alignment around, does this idea resonate um, with people? Are they excited about it? Um, and some of the, the best investor conversations that I had um, you know, basically went like, I get it. Um, it's probably a, a decent opportunity, but that's just not something I'm interested in pursuing right now. Um, I, we did another company that was felt like it was in a bit of a similar space and I, I just don't have the energy for it right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there does have to be a, a bit of a meeting of the minds, um, both, both sides uh, excited about um, going after it. Well, I think it's useful for folks to understand that many, not all, but many, maybe most investors will come up with themes or theses they're interested in, right? The future of work or software eats bad management and, you know, they've got a list of four or five themes they're interested in. And so it's kind of just a function of getting in front of those. And, and that's hard to triangulate sometimes, right? But you've got to kind of put yourself out there so you're <laughs> exposed to those guys with the right theme, right? Um, totally. Yeah. And I... I feel like I've read about um, plenty of magical fundraising uh, experiences. Um, certainly did not have that either for our first seed round uh, or the second one. Uh, and you know, obviously, um, maybe to state the obvious with the giant background, um, amazingly for fortunate and uh, some of the doors that that unlocks and conversations uh, I get to have. But even so, um, you know, the first seed round you know, it felt like, oh my gosh, uh, first week we, we really started raising money and almost immediately raised half the round. Mm -hmm. And then it was essentially a month long of uh, conversation after conversation that did not pan out. Some of them uh, felt like we got close. Um, some of them did not go well at all. Um, and then uh, all of a sudden, um, and, and this seems to typically happen as well, um, there was another week where it immediately closed and then got oversubscribed. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, second, uh, second wave of the seed round, that was a, a whole um, kind of different dynamic, but also um, also challenging. I think uh, maybe uh, there are some folks that are, are so good at the fundraising game that um, it's somehow easy. Uh, I've never never had that experience. When you get someone like Maynard Webb, Web Investment Network, kind of as your anchor, tenant, or quarterback, whatever you want to call it, how do you sort of leverage that to spin up other investors and connections or do they just sort of lead the show? Good question. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, and this has been uh, the same with all of our investors. Um, you know, it's actually sitting down and um, walking through, here's who we've talked to, here's who we're interested in chatting with, um, what's your input and advice, who can you make introductions to, um, and you know, great investors love working with other great investors. Um, they uh, care about their network um, and uh, bringing deals to one another uh, very much. And so uh, most of uh, the investor conversations that I've ended up having have uh, come through introductions. Yeah. Why did you do two seed rounds instead of, you know, a seed and then series A? Was it just stage of the company or traction? Wasn't maybe series A ready or what was the yeah. logic? Yeah. If if we were ready for Series A, uh, probably would have done that, uh, but we weren't. And you know, we had and uh, we had built a product. Uh, it took a little longer to really hone in on. This is exactly the the right thing, and um, you know, is more uh, experimentation iteration than than probably originally planned. And then you know, getting those first customers was really challenging. And so you know, as we you know could kind of project out. All right, we now have, um, I think, at the point where I really started looking at the second seed round, close to nine months of um, money left in the bank, so still a fair amount. Um, but I was like, all right, it's clear we're going to be at six months of money in the bank uh, relatively soon, and it feels like it's time to, to start scaling and going a little bit faster. Uh, but at that point, we probably had two customers uh, for real. Um, you know, we had a, a longer list of um, paying customers, but um, you know, one or two customers that really were using the product at big scale uh, that were paying us uh, larger amounts of revenue. Uh, and not a lot of um, the bigger questions answered. Um, and so that first round of investor conversations about the next seed round did not go well at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, all right, doesn't, it's not really clear that you guys have a strong plan for winning. Um, you're not doing the best job of articulating 
um, who your target buyer is or what the market or uh, what the bigger opportunity is. Yeah. Um, and for us in particular, there, uh, in particular with uh, investor conversations, um, there's enough overlap between HR performance management software and uh, what we consider um, our market to be, which is um, more operations. Um, so we target operational leaders like chief of staff or COO, in some cases CFO, um, and they're bringing Koan in essentially to run the company better mm -hmm. um, through that better uh, strategic cadence, uh, things like goals. The problem is uh, HR performance management software also has goals functionality. Um, so there are some great companies like Lattice and Reflective, um, they all have goals functionality as part of the software. Um, now that goals functionality is used very differently than um, the, the functionality that's part of Koan and what people are buying our software for. Um, but I was not good at telling that story, uh, especially as we were heading into the second seed round. Um, and so it became pretty challenging to come up with the right market thesis. Yeah, interesting. Cool, good. How many investors do you think you talked to to end up with the uh, uh, Pretty good list. Un Uncore, Crosslink, these are all great names. SV Angel. Four yeah, well, I feel extremely fortunate in the, the set of investors we get to work with. Uh, probably at least 30. Yeah. Did you go back, like Jive, you had Sequoia and Kleiner, which obviously are amazing names. Um, given your background with Jive, did you ever think about just going back to them? Aren't they almost obligated to uh, fund whatever deal you come up with <laughs> next if you've, you know, <laughs> taken a deal? Um, of course. Uh -huh. uh, so, um, Kleiner Perkins in particular, uh, unfortunately, has a direct conflict um, mm -hmm. with a company called BetterWorks, um, which is more going after that HR use case at this point, but certainly was one of the early, um, you know, probably the pioneer in goal software as a platform. Um, so that, that one was always a, a bit of a direct uh, conflict. Um, and of course, when they had uh, the chat with the Sequoia folks, um, and they were uh, kind enough to uh, bring some Sequoia scouts in um, to our round. Mm. Uh, so they are technically a, a part of um, the company and investors, um, but decided not to do a seed funding round. How does that work? What are, the scouts are given some money to play with by Sequoia's main fund and then it's sort of like a feeder deal or can you share any light on what Sequoia Scouts are all about? <laughs> yeah, there, there are articles uh, written about yeah. it. So um, that, that's definitely uh, a, a more detailed and better perspective on it. But uh, my understanding is essentially, yeah, it's a great way for the firm to find early stage deals that um, may not be ready for full seed funding round um, or the signaling of Sequoia or uh, mm -hmm. you know, for various other reasons, they, they just wouldn't find them. Uh, and so um, the money is from Sequoia itself, but uh, the scout um, shares uh, to some extent in the upside um, as that uh, investment plays out over time. Oh, interesting. So they're getting maybe a piece of the carry for finding, bringing the deal. Um, I, I think so, exactly. Like that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, very good. Well, this is all good stuff. What do you think, maybe just since you mentioned the word signaling, like how important you think is signaling and picking investors or is, I hear all kinds of advice on this show, everything from that doesn't matter, you should just have a good relationship versus, you know, it, it's valuable to have the signaling of a really well-known fund. Did that enter your mind much at all? I think everything you just said is probably true um, all yeah. at the same time. Um, you know, I think uh, definitely you know, who you're working with and the quality of your investor is uh, incredibly important. And you know, I remember uh, way back in the early days um, before uh, we'd ever worked with uh, venture capital and you know, our experience um, was graduated from college in the year 2000. Um, I'm thinking back to the Jive days and my Jive co-founder. Uh, we moved from Iowa City, Iowa to San Francisco and uh, worked at a venture funded startup uh, in a condemned building um, in downtown uh, with this great collection of um, other employees and people, but um, in a company that never really had a, a viable business uh, strategy and uh, a lot of venture funding. Um, so it was kind of all the, um, not the egregious excesses of uh, the dot com bubble, but uh, we felt like we were part of that. Um, and so our very first experience was seeing um, how all that imploded and then building a um, scrappy bootstrap startup um, out of that and partially with the conviction of 
oh my God, the only way to do this is to be profitable and to have a real business and you got to kind of fight, um, you know, to build it. And uh, in those early days, we were probably anti-VC um, based on that uh, super early exposure. Uh, and so, you know, as we walked into it and thought about, well, what does it look like to take um, venture funding for Jive? Uh, and I would read the articles like, uh, just, it's only about the money. Um, you know, only think about what these VCs do in terms of the dollars and any of these other promises around the impact they're going to have on your business. Um, none of that's actually true. Yeah. And I'm happy to say, um, you know, all these years later, um, and based on the, the, the real experience of it, um, the right investor and the right partner can actually have a very profound impact on a company um, and act as uh, almost a, a partner in it. Um, you know, certainly it's um, whoever is inside the building and, you know, actually they can't build a business for you. They can't have the right answers, um, but they can ask great questions. They can, um, you know, apply the right help. Um, so I'm a huge believer in finding great investors um, and the right investor relationships. And I think there is some real signaling, especially depending on, um, you know, where your market opportunity is. Um, but there's a very long list of great investors out there. Uh, it's not just uh, the short list of big names. Yeah. It's interesting. You, that story, though, is kind of funny because that whole focus on profitability, which, you know, is now back in vogue, right? Now with some of these uh, blow ups like the WeWork debacle and stuff now, <laughs> this focus on like the profitable startup is now trendy again, right? We kind of go back and forth on this. I every think, there's a, I think there's a happy middle ground. Um, and one of the things, um, you know, I always think about, for example, is um, you know, there, there can be, you know, the idea of, oh my God, I always have to chase the biggest valuation that I possibly can. Um, that's not always uh, a great idea, uh, especially in the early stage of a company. Because um, once you have that big valuation, it has a profound impact on what your next funding round is going to be. And stepping into a, a giant valuation too early can make the journey much, much more challenging. Totally. Um, so sure, you're potentially... Um, leaving some money on the table or giving up more equity. Um, but you're also crafting a, a, a stronger path for the company uh, by choosing the right valuation. Good stuff. Were both your seed rounds priced rounds or notes or safes or just what's the structure you did? Yeah, we did. Uh, the first one was a safe uh, with a cap. Uh, and it was before, um, before safes had be, been rewritten. Uh, I think it's a little bit clearer now where you have a post money valuation for safes and uh, that's a great way of doing it. And then we did the second seed round as a price round. Okay. Uh -huh. Touch on that a little bit. What do you mean um, about safes being rewritten or, or what do you mean there? So there, uh, there was an the old version of safes yeah. um, and you know, it actually became a little bit challenging to compute. Um, what's, you know, how's this all going to translate as you go through a price round uh, the first time. Now I see most uh, folks doing uh, the more modern version of a safe where you'll agree on a, a post money valuation. Got it. Okay. Uh huh. I understand that. It's kind of the assumed modern version of a safe, which is great. I think that was an improvement. Yeah. Cool. All right. Very good. Well, I won't keep you much longer. Anything we haven't covered, any other tips uh, for founders, you know, chasing money in 2020 or uh, uh, things you would do differently if you did it all over again? You know, when I, I was thinking of back on the, the second seed round and that experience and um, the activity that was deceptively valuable and more challenging than um, I ever thought it would be was uh, actually putting together a good version of a pitch deck. Mm -hmm. um, and generally speaking, um, I, I don't think I ever really use the pitch deck in any investor conversation. Uh, every once in a while, I would. Um, you know, investors like to actually go through the pitch deck page by page. And in some of those early conversations, um, but it was never really about that. It was about, can uh, we actually tell the story of the company and why it exists and what we're trying to do in a really cohesive way? Um, there's a little bit of the trend of uh, writing out as a memo instead of a pitch deck. And I think that is great mm -hmm. as well. Um, but you know, if you can't articulate the story of the company and um, using the memo or the pitch deck as a forcing function to have that conversation internally, it was really hard and it was really valuable. Yeah, that's great. Good. Any tips on that? On just, you know, I'd like that as kind of the fu forcing function to tell your story. Anything you found helpful in putting that deck together or just kind of bang it out and run it by people? Yeah, lots of feedback, um, lots of iteration, and that it takes longer than uh, you think it will. Um, you know, it probably depends a little bit on the nature of what you're attacking. Um, some 
some opportunities uh, and products are much clearer in the early stages. Um, some you know, take a little bit more experimentation and the category is relatively early. I feel like that's the case for Koan. Um, it feels a lot clearer uh, now that we sit in 2020 than it did back in 2016 or even 2018 or 2019 early days. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's um, give yourself more time on it, get lots of feedback. Um, and some of the early investor conversations, you'll get very pointed feedback, uh, especially if they're great investors, about where your thinking is muddy. Yeah, good. Very good. All right, Matt. Well, if people want to learn more, it's koan.co, K-O-A-N.co, right? Exactly. Anything you want to promote, plug, open job recs? Um, is this, at what stage should a company start to look at your offering? I mean, how big should they be? What's the right sweet spot? We, we love having startups uh, using the product. We have a version of the pricing that is super startup friendly, in fact. Um, I don't think that you have to use software to do some of these um, positive disciplines like goal setting and regular reflection. Um, but building that muscle really early on um, actually is a pretty good idea. And so if you're a startup and you're thinking about how do I build a company to last and create some of those um, you know, good muscles around leadership and operational and strategic cadence, We'd love to have you check out Koan, uh, whether you use the software or just take advantage of uh, some of the resources and, and writings that we've done. Um, cool. And I, I love uh, working with and hearing from other entrepreneurs. Awesome. Well, good luck. This sounds fun. Happy New Year. Uh, and Happy uh, New Year. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah. We'll catch you after your next round. Thank you. Thank you.